So it's my great uh, pleasure now to have a conversation with uh, Nicola, Nicola Hazard. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is just a little a, a question and answer. Um, uh, with, I'll be focusing a bit on the themes of the day. Um, Nicholas is going to start with a discussion about a book that he wrote uh, on um, the, the good life is in the village, is how it roughly translates into English. Um, but I, just to give you a quick background on Nicola, he, um, he, is, he, he is, came in from Paris to have this conversation with us. He is, uh, runs the largest impact investing fund in Europe. He, through his organization, INCO, runs the biggest uh, impact investing conference in Europe, Impact Squared, um, has been a leader on, on, on social finance uh, issues for, for many years, which is part of why the European Commission has uh, asked him to be a special advisor. So we're very fortunate to have him. Um, it, it, if you, if you looked at the Paris uh, phone book, you would not find many ha hazards in it, by the way. That's a kind of a new, which is part of why Nicholas created a, a close a, a tie to the US early on, because he realized that there was a county named after him uh, in, in, this, in the American South. And that was from watching um, the Dukes of Hazard, which was how he made this conne early connection to, to the United States. So, um, but, um, so, so Nicola, tell us a little bit. I, you know, you, you you talk about the good lives in the village, um, and and you live in Paris. You know, a city that everybody loves to visit and wants to live in. So how 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 are you? How did you come to this idea that um, that there was this sort of bubbling up of an interest to sort of move to smaller towns, to sort of leave the city, and what 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 really drove you to write the book? Thank you, thank you so much, and thanks for having me. Um, it all started actually with the pandemic, mm. and I think it was a new start for a lot of people. But actually, I had like the time of my life at the during the first months of the pandemic. I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> Paris was totally empty. <laughs> like for two or three months, I had like the one of the most beautiful cities of the world for myself. Honestly, <laughs> there was no one there, and because all the Parisian they've left the city like during the pandemic. And I think it was pretty much the same in the US. But this was very, very, uh, very, very uh, scary at some point. But very, very, it was a big, big movement at that time. And so I wonder why, when, it, when times get difficult, why all the people are fleeing, why are getting away. And I just had this number that was absolutely crazy that in France, uh, for 80% of the people, a good life is a life in the countryside. Hmm. And at the same time, for 80%, 80% of the French people live in cities. And that's mm. the same, and you have the same statistics in Europe. So people literally live where they don't want to live. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I tried to figure out why uh, we had this big, big trend. And actually, it's very simple. Economic opportunities are in big cities, are in metropolis. So if you want to find a job, if you want to have a job, you have to live in a city, although uh, for lots of people, a city and metropolis are uh, linked to a bad quality of life, like uh, being stuck in transportation for hours, uh, living in very small spaces, not being uh, in touch with the, with the nature, uh, everything is very costly, and so on. And so I thought to myself, why don't we help and why don't we support the countryside and help people move and maybe have like one million or five million French people that live in cities move to the rural and to the countryside. So how do you create that um, economic opportunity in places that, I mean, people move to the city, they, they're rational actors, they're, they're moving to where the opportunities are. How do you create the opportunities in these smaller places? So I, I really think that uh, the time, we, we had this trend uh, that started a, a few centuries ago where people, the majority of the people were in the countryside. And then they left uh, slowly with, through the different uh, industrial revolutions and they came into the cities. But it was more forced because of economic opportunities, because it was the way, if you wanted to, to live your sexual orientation, you can live in a city. If you wanted to have access to culture, you went to cities. There, there were lots of reasons. But today, I think that it's not true anymore. Mm -hmm. Lots of, uh, at least in Europe, of course, lots of the rural places are very, very open. There's a lot of culture. There's a lot of, uh, lots of people are, are very open. There are lots of opportunities. And I met, so I went during the pandemic for three 
three months, I went on a tour through France to go on t into all these small villages that are doing stuff that are pretty amazing that no one knows about because also the media, the journalists, they're not very interested in what's happening in the rural uh, areas. And to show that actually there are some people that live there that can be very innovative, sometimes more even than in big cities, that invent new ways of consuming, of producing, of, 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 of producing energy and so on. And, and that it's the, maybe the, the heart of the innovation for the future and for the 21st century is in uh, rural areas and not in cities anymore. So I really think that metropolis, like they're, we're done with it and we should be <laughs> done with it, or at least uh, we need to find the right balance between the two because we need both, especially because of the big, big uh, challenges that we have, climate change, agriculture, food, and so on. We need more, uh, more and more uh, rural areas, and we need to make them more innovative and more sustainable. So we, earlier today, we heard of an example where sort of a whiz kid uh, from a small town in the Adirondacks leaves and uh, comes back to start a, a, composite, uh, chem, a composite company that then he decides to use that insight to sort of build a special kind of bike that's just designed for that terrain. So there's this, there's something that, there's an example of somebody being very innovative and really tailoring your sort of approach. Can you give us an example of somebody who's just really taken advantage? Like, this is our comparative advantage. This is what makes us special. This is what's gonna make us cool and bring people in from all over. You write about many of the examples. Maybe you could share a couple. So there's a small village in, uh, next to Bordeaux in the Bordeaux region, but like an hour and a half from Bordeaux that is called Saint-Pierre de Frugy. It's a, it's, a, it's a small village in the Dordogne area, which is very, very rural. Um, and this town was almost a ghost town. Like this village, like there used to be a lot of people and then now there they were only like 100, 150 people like living there. Um, and so the, 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 no one wants, wanted to be a mayor at that time. So no one was interested to be elected and to be a mayor. So they asked the oldest guy of the city, uh, <laughs> who, was, who is the former guy that was working in the BMW garage in Bordeaux. So, and he came he there to retire. They asked him, do you want to be the mayor? So he said, I have no choice. Uh, we don't have any ch in school anymore, no more shop, everything is closed. So he decided, he said, okay. So he was the only one, he got elected, of course, 100%, that was f fabulous. And he started, and um, his daughter, she was a vegan. And she told him about like what organic food is, how about like all these trends. And he was like, oh, that's interesting. We should actually maybe try something like that in the village and, and, and start, for example, with, without using pesticides for like the streets in the village, for the cemetery and so on. So he started to do that. Then he started also to um, create some uh, uh, hiking trails also around. And slowly like people around like the, the, the whole region, they started to say, oh, that's the organic village because mm -hmm. they're doing lots of uh, stuff for, against pesticides, for climate change and so on. And slowly people came, they were curious. They came to look, look at this village. And after a while, um, actually they were like, oh, it's a very nice village, but there's no, you know, in France it's very important. There's no uh, bar anymore. There's no, we, we can't drink coffee, uh, nowhere. We, uh, so they decided actually to reopen a place that was shut down and to build a small bar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the bar was taking off. And then after that, he did a lot of initiatives and people came from the outside and said, oh, we want to be part of that. We want to help, we want to support, we want to uh, develop uh, like organic farming. So lots of farmers started to do organic farming. They, they started having a label and so on. And after five to six years, it's very, very impressive. Now the, the, um, the, the village has doubled in terms of population, but they also reopened the school. There's another school that was open. They've been doing lots of stuff uh, with opening a shop, an organic shop. Now it's, an orga very, it's a very famous one in the region. Lots of people come from the outside. And it's now, it has the label of organic village, the first organic village of France. Everything is organic. And so people are coming even from China and from Japan. The ambassador of Japan was there and, and all the people to see 
what's an organic village and so on. So this small, tiny village that was like left without anything, without shops, without anything, they've been able to really to change the trend yeah. and make it something very attractive. And now this village is very famous. And, 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 and I remember going there and there was a queue outside of the city hall because people were looking for crops and, and properties there. And it's already, already full. So, so how? Um, so that's a great story, and it's certainly exciting to hear a turnaround like that. Um, we had a question earlier today about um, because there's some other examples that were mentioned in, in the course of the, the the conversation today about uh, people creating a, 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 a sort of a natural amenity or or some type of uh, entertainment venue or things like that hotel um, that kind of spark interest back in the community. But it, um, the question was. You know, do you always have to have some kind of entrepreneur genius doing that, or can just ordinary people do it? Like, did I mean that's a great example? I mean, you had a you had this kind of inspired person who had the connection to this sort of concept, but like, um, how do other places do this, and 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 how do they finance it? That's another mm -hmm. question I have for you. So actually, all the people that I met, so it's uh, 30 stories of people that are doing amazing things are 30 very ordinary people, but are doing extraordinary things. Yeah. Like it's absolutely f fantastic things. And they're very simple people, you know, like there's this mayor of this another village that decided also that the school was about to shut down because it's a lot about that, like like schools, shops, it's absolutely key for the, for the you know, for the living of, of, a, of villages and, and areas like that. So he decided, for example, because he wanted uh, he wanted the school to to stay open, and you need a minimum amount of kids if you want to keep your school open. So he decided to buy through the city lots of uh, properties and lots of um, uh, crops, and he said, "I give that for free to the families that come here." So he did a big, big announcement throughout uh, the country saying. You want a free house, you get a free house, but you need to come there and you need to come with your family. And if you stay there more than 10 years, then the house is yours. Mm -hmm. If you stay less, you need to pay back the house, uh, the, the, you know, I have a pretty fair amount. And so actually it was amazing because the people from everywhere came yeah. and lots of family, family came into the, into the village. And not only the school was open, but also like people started developing businesses, like one opened a bakery uh, shop, another one opened a hair salon, and so on. And so the activity started. So what I, what, what, and I have like tons of examples of that, is that you don't need to put like massive capital at the beginning and saying, yeah, we're gonna put all this money and then it will come. No, it's ideas and it comes slowly. And, and you start with something, you don't necessarily know where exactly you're going, but you start, you start, and you see it's coming. So this example is great. The guy wouldn't have thought about like opening new shops and opening new activities, but actually he did uh, indirectly. And so for the money, uh, for, the, for, for the funding, you know, in lots of places like that, <clears throat> like the land doesn't cost a lot, like yeah. houses, they don't cost a lot. and. And, and you don't need massive money to be able to do that. But of course, there are some issues, you know, like uh, when I hear like the, 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 the debate about like broadband and internet connection and connectivity and so on, that's absolutely yeah. key. Yeah. Uh, but the difference maybe between the Europe and, and France is that we, uh, and, and Europe and in the US, sorry, is we in Europe, we believe that uh, it's a public service, like having a hospital to have like connectivity and having broadband, mm -hmm. and it should be like the European Union and the state should do that. Yeah. So the big telecom operators, they have to do it. If they want yeah. the big one in the big cities, they have to do the smaller one in the villages. That's a kind of a deal that exists. Yeah. Uh, but you need like a, a global perspective and strategy for that. For sure, for sure. That is a really interesting idea about this idea that it's kind of a deal to fix up a town versus invest in a city. Like I, I, I'm, I'm just thinking a little bit about this. Uh, several people today talked about how they were reopening something. Like your, like this one example, we're reopening the bar, um, and that's not that expensive actually. Like it's an existing building, and you just do some retrofit on it. I, I remember being in a presentation, um, the Chan Zuckerberg Institute, CZI. 
I was in San Francisco for many years and, and I was uh, attending this presentation and they said, oh, well, we have this big affordable housing um, initiative and we're going to, um, we're going to invest $50 million into affordable housing in the nine Bay Area counties, right? Now, this is from the founders of Facebook, and they, you know, pretty single-handedly are generating a lot of price pressure on housing. And, and $50 million, I mean, it almost felt like a Dr. Evil moment. You're like, really? $50 million? That, will buy, that could build one apartment building. So, like, pick one of the nine counties, you know. Um, and build an apartment building there, then you're done. You know, that, that, that commitment is meaningless. It commensurate with the scale of the problem. But this idea that we're $50 million over 10 different villages, so I'm just wondering if you can kind of like, what's, what, how, how much further does the money go in rural places, I guess is my question. Well, yeah, it's, it's interesting because like with one, with one dollar, you can really leverage a lot and you can really do a lot. But there are also citizens that are participating. Mm -hmm. I have this example of a village in the south, uh, southwest of France where they decided, so there are 200, it's a very, very tiny village, but it's very uh, sunny, it's very nice. South, south of France, it's uh, very sunny, it's very, uh, very good for, for the sun. And so they decided that they wanted to be independent in terms of energy. And they didn't want to, uh, to, you know, to be uh, in touch or like uh, with, with like the big, uh, big companies that are doing, especially the private one. They don't. They wanted to be independent in terms of energy. That was key, and they wanted to do something for climate change. And so the mayor offered that they create a company with all the citizens of the village mm. to uh, create on a on a communal, like on a city kind of uh, uh, land uh, that they do a solar panel village, like a solar panel, a solar farm. Yeah. Uh, but a small one, not the big, big one, you know, but only for the village and that, that, that was it. Mm -hmm. And maybe some more, but, uh, but, but not very, very more, not much more. And so they decided to do that. So everybody puts like, a hundred uh, between a hundred dollars to a thousand dollars. The youngest one was eleven years old, uh, <laughs> even a year old, and he put like fifty dollar. And each of them, because they did like a kind of co-op kind of system, had like a part of the company. Mm -hmm. And now, so they invest for that. It didn't. They didn't needed a lot of money. They did that. And now, for the past ten years, they're totally independent of energy. That means that they don't pay, pay any bill in terms of energy for their energy, electricity, or anything like that. Plus, they have a surplus that they can sell to uh, the big big companies. And actually. They, they make between uh, around 5% of interest rate every year. Wow. So they just invest, invest their money. They're independent. They do something for climate change. They're a very small village and haven't been helped by anyone. Mm -hmm. And they did that on their own, showing that I don't necessarily think that we need like the big infrastructure and they're going to change the world and they're going to save the planet and so on. Mm -hmm. But I believe that local initiatives and local projects like that can be very, very uh, fruitful and can have a very strong impact. The only problem is that this village had like, like the energy and the, the knowledge to do it, but lots of people, they would love to do stuff, but they think they can't. And so that's why also I wanted to write a book to say, yeah, you can do it everywhere. And actually you're in a village, you can be very, very uh, innovative and you can be in advance and you can fight climate change and you can be really uh, responsible and you can make money at the same time. Yeah, that's really inspiring. I, 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 I wish we had more time to talk about this, but I'm running, running short on time. So I just have, I have um, two, two, two more things I want to ask one question and then I want to give you the final word. So, so think about what you want to say as a final uh, uh, um, address to the audience. Um, and uh, it's not like you're, you have the weight of Tocqueville on your shoulders, but there is like these questions of if you can think about how some of these um, questions land in the United States as opposed to France. But the question I have before that last, last comment is really about culture. And I think about like 
when I visit my husband's family in Ohio, we will drive out of our way to go to an Amish bakery and get, uh, you know, because we know that's, that's where some of the best bread is, you know, in, in the area. And there's something, there's a cultural aspect to that. Like they, they, and they market that to some degree. Earlier in the conversation, there was a discussion about Creole culture on the Gulf Coast or, um, or um, the, the, the culture in Puerto Rico and how that was something to build on. I just wonder, are there examples in the book that just use culture as the, as the hook? There are, there are lots of, like, everything is, is uh, very much, it's very cultural, because, of course, you cannot have, like, an idea, you cannot do Coca-Cola, you know, like, having one product and then sell it everywhere. It doesn't work like that. Like, rural innovation is not like that, and innovation in these uh, areas. Um, so that's why we've actually we've created a big center in the Pyrenees, so in the, in the mountains in the south of France, which is the first uh, incubator in Europe for rural innovation. Mm. So basically we want to uh, create and we have lots of projects that come and that try to um, find solution uh, for mobility is key, you know, like how you, uh, you don't have to drive all the time, uh, how for healthcare, for education, for, uh, you know, uh, producing locally and so on. And we need to reinvent these models. But of course, we can't say that there is one model and then we're going to do it everywhere. Everything it has, needs to be adapted locally and it's very, very, very key. So for example, um, I have this uh, young uh, uh, guy that invented a, an app for uh, people to order some meat, you know, but uh, and some food from local farmers and local people all around and 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 of course it's like the pr products that you get there are very specific compared to the, the to the other one if you want to do organic food if you want to do sustainable food we take a range of 80 like 70 miles around uh, you can do it actually and you can live like during the whole year mm -hmm. but of course it will be different from a re from a region to another so you need to adjust and you need to rethink differently and think that the innovation needs to be bottom up really yeah. and, and not top down uh, and that's very very key because uh, the solution comes from the ground and the people in the rural areas they have plenty of ideas they have plenty of solutions. We think that we're going to teach them from the big cities how to do and so on, and yeah. they're, they're, they're not educated or anything. That's absolutely not true. They know the territory. They know the, their, their place better than anyone else, and they have the big solutions. And we need actually to trust them and build a framework. If you're an institution, a, you know, a state, a, 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 a country, you need to build a framework, but leave the people do because they have a plenty of ideas. That's so powerful. We've, we've heard that many times today, that the innovation is everywhere, that you know, we need to create the enabling uh, tools and institutions and policies and business practices that support that. Uh, and that it's wildly individual, that it's unique in each place. That's really a remarkable, and that we've heard that many times. Um, we are going to have to wrap things up to you. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds for a final word. So actually what I think is very important, this issue is not only about, uh, it's of course economic de development, but I think what I, we, I've seen in Europe, and that's why we're working a lot with the European Commission on that, it's a question of democracy a, a lot, and it's a question of trust into institutions. If we don't address these rural issues, we're gonna have a lot, we had the yellow vest in France, which is like the kind of start of like how um, our democracies are gonna are gonna be um, in danger in the future as well, because like people are getting really really angry, especially in countryside, because they have the impression that they're left over and that mm -hmm. all the money goes into metropolis, big cities, and so on. But they're actually they are also very key. Uh, lots of them are struggling, have facing big big economic issues, and it's really a question of democracy, because lots of the people that live there. Uh, think that more and more that having a strong leader is better mm. than having a democracy, you know? Sure, sure, and sure. so the way that the, lots of people are thinking is not going the right direction, especially among the young generation. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a problem of, you know, saying, okay, we're fine, we're, 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 we're tackling the, the big problems in the cities, we're putting all the money there. That's good, and I think there are lots of inequalities in cities and we must tackle that. But like rural issues is absolutely key. Uh, we're not gonna have and solve 
uh, the, the big demographic issues that we're going to have. We're 8 billion, we're going to be 10 billion with create, by creating, you know, like uh, tomato plants on the top of our roofs and the big buildings, you know, like yeah. the countryside is doing that. The energy that we're going to produce is going to be produced there. So it's a question of democracy and the sustainability of the long term. So I hope you're going to work a lot on that in the U.S. as well. <laughs> well, you're, well, no, you got us all fired up. So we're definitely going to do that. And we're, we are here at the Federal Bank of New York and spend a lot more time on it also. So, so please uh, look out for more material on that from us. Please stay, stay in contact with us and in conversation with us. Very quickly, I want to thank a few people, and, uh, and then let's go uh, have a, a glass of wine out in the, in the lobby. So. Uh, in, in the room, uh, Carmi Recto, uh, who really was spearheaded this from the very beginning. Thank you, Carmi. Um, I don't see Marissa Casillas Barnes or Kelly Jackson, but also you've, you've heard a lot from them today, and, and I'm sure Kelly uh, rep, uh, introduced you into the building, so I wanted to thank them. And, and, and lastly, I want to thank our partner at the Board of Governors, Andrew Dumont, who really is the intellectual driving force behind all of this. We wouldn't be here without him today. So thank you all for joining us, and please join us at the reception. Thanks thank again. You.